All right, guys. So, hey, guys. Time to get going. Okay, so a couple things. Do not close that file in Photoshop yet. Keep the tree open. Um, but I want to look at a couple other things really quick. So if I can get everybody to, again, go in line and go, go online and go back to our Moodle site. I want to just show you. I want to go through basically the assignments that were the, the, what was due today. Um, and again, we'll explain a little bit more. And I also want to go through all the assignments that are going to be due, due for next week so there isn't as much question about all of this. So if you can get to our Moodle site and you can get to week four, we're going to look at the assignments that were due for today. And I'll tell you, uh, I'm going to extend one of them just a little bit for you guys. So um, you don't need to freak out about that part. But if you open up assignment 4.1, the one that's called Keys Part 1, <clears throat> basically it lays this out. You're to make two different kinds of images, one high key and one low key. We looked at those last week on Google Images. I Granted, we looked at them in less than 30 seconds. Um, that was my picture lecture. But I, again, I, I, my sense is that you all are more visual than you are. Um, um, uh, uh, I'm just, you're more visual. So I just thought it was a very obvious way to sort of talk about what it was a high key image and a low key image. And I, again, reiterated, Google Images is a great resource to go to if you don't understand a term. Just go there. Google Images, not Google, but Google Images. Um, type in high key, and you'll see thousands of examples of high key imagery. Type in low key, you'll see thousands of examples of low key imagery. And you look at the commonality of all of them, and you see, oh, yeah, well, that low key, it's all really dark shit. And the high key, it's all really light shit. You know, I mean, that should be obvious, right? If you have any questions about this stuff that don't seem apparent, uh, please, then, that's the stuff that you put into the excuse me, do you know how to form, and your classmates will answer, I will answer. So at any rate, here it just says, so what is due in this? It explains basically what a high key image is, primarily consists of light tones, high key image yields, blah, 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 low key, primarily, primarily dark tones, blah, 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 what you're going to learn in all this, do a catalog, Lightroom catalog of files you shot with keywords, metadata. Do not include the negative files when exporting your catalog. There is no mention of prints in here. That's going to come later. I try to break this down into stages so that you guys aren't simply inundated with having to shoot and print all in the same week. Isn't that nice of me? So anyway, that's all that I want from this week. So. If you kick back out and look at the next assignment, the 4.2 assignment, this is strictly an evaluation that you have. It's a, just a written part about how your first, this first assignment went for you. And so I'm asking you right here to submit an online text self-evaluation. So what were your successes? What worked for you? Um, did you feel like that, that you, know, you answered the assignment, that you were able to complete? Are you completely confused about this? You have no idea what's going on. How did you deal with any of that? It's all basically, and it, it's brief. You don't need to, I don't need a dissertation. I need something brief. It's all submitted online. So if you open up your page here, you should see a place where you can actually type text directly in, or you can type into a text editor if you want to, copy and paste it, and then just submit it via Moodle. That way, you do not have to worry about printing this stuff out. You don't have to worry about dropping a file in the Dropbox. If you just do it here on Moodle, it'll be good. Does that make sense, everybody? Or does that not make sense to anyone? So you guys have got until Friday to do this. And again, it doesn't need to be exhaustive. What I'm trying to get, though, is for you to articulate to me the things that worked for you, the things that didn't work, the what you understood about it. Did it help you? Did it not help you? Do you think it was worthless? Do you think, you know, it's just that's all I'm looking for in this. There's no real right or wrong in this. If you just do it, you'll get 100 for it. OK, so that's assignment 4.2. 4.3 is to watch. There's a, a video about using a color passport checker. Now, we have gone over. I've shown you a whole bunch of pictures about that have the passport checker in mind. Um, but I want to, at some point, I was going to do it tonight, but I don't think we're going to have time to do it tonight, to really um, show you guys exactly how I use this thing with a camera and software and light and the whole nine yards. Uh, but I think it's going to be too ambitious to get to that tonight. But don't worry. This isn't going to have, this isn't, this is not going to impact your next assignment. It isn't going to impact anything uh, as far as this class really goes, other than giving you the tool set that you need to actually have perfect exposure and perfectly neutral color in your own life. 
So that takes care of the assignments that were due up until today. So hopefully your Lightroom catalog you have, uh, the self-evaluation you've got until Friday, and I'm never going to know whether you watch this damn movie or not. So what's due for next week? If you can click on assignment 5.1, this is the thing we're calling keys to. So this is the second part of the key assignment. And again, it starts out and it basically describes, this is just copy and pasted. It's exactly the same information that was on the other, except for the part where it says due. So what is going to be due next week is two prints that you actually do through Photoshop as grayscale. Now this is misleading. I do not want you to convert your images to grayscale. You are going to print them in black and white. They will be converted to black and white, but I don't want you, I want you to use the method that we just did. And the method that we just did, if you go back and you look at your tree right now, go back into Photoshop and you click and you look at this tree, you will see that even though it says black and white up here in because of your black and white layer, that indeed, if you click on the uh, smart object at the bottom, this is an RGB image. This is an 8-bit RGB image. You can see it right up here in the title. Um, uh, this is what I'm looking for. I don't want you to actually convert this to a grayscale. To convert this to a grayscale, you would come up to image, down to a uh, mode, and you would change this to grayscale. I do not want you to do that. That defeats the entire purpose of this. This still has the color image in it so that we can leverage that to uh, affect our black and white. So when it says here in the assignment, what's due is exactly what you're looking at in black and white in Photoshop, that you're actually going to print these through Photoshop. We are going to use the advanced black and white printing method. I'm going to show that to you today. There's two prints due. One will be a high key image. The other will be low key image. I want not only the prints, which we will critique, I want the layered Photoshop files. The layered Photoshop files are what I will grade, and those will be things that you drop in the Dropbox. Are there questions about this? It says it right here. Right here, I need prints, both layered Photoshop files and prints are due. So just like you did for the last assignment. Does that make sense? So we'll look at the prints next week. We will meet down in that very same 905. We will do critique first. Then we'll come up here. You'll be able to drop your layered files onto the uh, server because that's what I grade, guys. It doesn't, that's why I don't collect your prints um, because the truth of the matter is if you're struggling with stuff, there's no way for me to tell by looking at a print if you are having issues with Photoshop. And that's what this is really all about. So that's why I grade the layered Photoshop files. They, 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 are, um, they give me more information. I have a better understanding of what's going on with you guys. So does this make sense? OK, again, I will show you the advanced black and white. So go back one more time. There's a couple of assignments that are due. The next one is we are starting our next assignment, the part one of our next assignment, which is called typology. If you click on this, this is what the assignment is. Again, it's another shooting assignment. We, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about what typology actually is visually in just a minute. So um, maybe we'll come back to this. But again, what is going to be due next week in addition to your two prints and the files of those two prints is yet and again another Lightroom catalog of 20 of your top selects containing the keywords, metadata, and when we talk about starring and flagging, you guys already know about rating and all that stuff, right? Okay, so that's all this is about. Um, and again, we will go through exactly what um, typology actually means. It's, 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 I think it's an interesting assignment. It's relatively simple. Don't, don't, don't get too flipped out about it. Um, there is a reading. There are two readings that happen in this class. This is the first of the two. The first is this one, and it's called Reframing Photography Typology. And if you click on it, you will go into this PDF. It's relatively brief, and there's lots of pictures, so don't get flipped out about it. See the pictures right here in the middle that you can't read because they're too small? Don't worry about it. Anyway, that's all this is uh, to get through uh, typology. Uh, and that's all it is. It's just a PDF. It's a scan of a book on photography, and this is about typology. There is another written assignment to say it's just a brief summary of what you read in this. And all this is to show me, because again, I have no way to know that you actually read this thing. So this reading summary, if you click on this, this is another online submission. It's a paragraph or two about what you got out of that reading. So again, what is typology? Submit your reading feedback. That's all it is. It doesn't have to be that long. <clears throat> Don't tell anybody I ever told you this. 
but you could actually Google the word topology, go to a wiki page, copy it, and paste it into here, and I would never know, <laughs> except that you would sound so brilliant, I would really wonder if that's what you were doing, but nonetheless, I tell this to everybody. I think photography, by and large, or it's what I, what I do, what I, I fabricate things in life. That's what I do. When I make photographs, I fabricate things. I am not ashamed to call them lies. That's what I do. I take really ugly things, and I make them really pretty and, uh, to get people to buy them. That's what I do. So I'm all about lying and cheating. I think the better liar and cheater you are, the better photographer you will actually be. That's the name of the game. So if you can pull it off, more power to you. A million. No. It, it just so that I know you read the article, so that you have some sense of what's topology. If I came up to you and said, Lexi, please tell me what topology means to you, you could say to me, well, I, you know, I see it as this collection of, of visual imagery that has a, a real similarity to it. All the images are done the same way, the shot at the same focus, the shot at the same blah, 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 blah. See? Reading, I'm really good at Okay, well, then there you go. This will be a good one for you. So that's assignment 5.4. Click back one more time. <clears throat> the final thing here is uh, a first draft of your final proposal. Now, if you click on this, you will see it's all I'm asking for is two paragraphs. It doesn't even have to really be two paragraphs. Look through this thing. I don't think, let me see when this guy's due. I don't know if this is due the very next week or not. Uh, it is due the next week. I need you at this stage of the game to start to think about your final project, what you're going to want to do for this class, okay? Are you a fashion shooter? Do you want to shoot fashion pictures for this class? Are you a landscape person? Do you want to do that? Are you a, 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 a portraitist and you want to do that? Just some idea. I need you to start thinking about it because what I want to avoid is everybody, because this, this just classically happens, it's two weeks from the end of the semester, and you're like, shit, i got to shoot a final project for Digital One. And you'll just, you'll hate your life, right? So I, I, it, it, this can change, it can evolve, but I need you to put something down on a piece of paper that's just, this is kind of what I'm thinking about doing. I really want to shoot Hilson. I really want to shoot um, pictures of the lake. I want to do five-hour exposures of the lake in the middle of the night. That's what I want to do. I want whatever it is you want to do, okay? But part of this goes back to, again, I, and, and, and like what Erin had done for her first project last week that she showed. She started this whole thing out with an idea, with a relatively clear idea, something that she could have written down, something that she had articulated in her mind, and I think as a consequence, she had a really strong group of images because she had this focused idea. And so that's what I'm hoping this will actually spur on in you guys. Does that make sense? So again, it does not need to be exhaustive. I don't, I'm, I'm glad you're a good reader. I'm dyslexic. I read incredibly slow. Uh, so uh, I don't read, I don't want volumes. Um, okay. I think that gets us through everything. There's also an assignment reading in here. For those of you, um, uh, and Kevin, this, you know, again, it sounds like you've actually seen the light here. Um, uh, but this is the chapter in our textbook on uh, doing um, uh, masking and layers. Um, so it's a, it, again, it would be a good refresher um, for you guys as far as that part goes. So that's kind of what next week is all about. Are there any questions about this? Okay, I need everybody to go to Google Images right now, if you would, for me. So I just hit Command N to bring up a new dialog box. Type in Google Images and go to it. And then once you get there, type in the word typology, T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y, and hit search. And you will get, hopefully again, a very quick idea of what typology is. So I'm going to click on just the very first image to bring it up so that we can really talk about typology. There's several different versions of this. Um, and so this is, I'm going to introduce this part of it is, like I said, there's two different kinds. In this one, what you, is a collection of pictures, and that's ultimately what yours is going to be. Yours is actually going to be printed out this way. Now, some people actually try to do all of this in a single print. I'm not going to make you guys do that. But what I will ask you to do then is if you don't want to do this in a single print, if this is the type of typology that you want to shoot, that you actually do individual prints that are all exactly the same size, and then you could then put this up on a board to critique and still see it in this sort of grid format. Yeah. 
Um, we are. So the only thing that is due next week is your shooting of this, the catalog. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, again, if you look at this, and it's the things that you need to take into account when we're talking about this, and this part is really important. What is important about this is that the way you approach your shooting is not only it's incredibly structured, but it is repeatable. So when you look at this, when we look at these images right here, all of these images are scaled roughly to the exact same size. They are all shot from exactly straight on to the building. They're all black and white. They're all framed in exactly the same way. When you look at the skies around these, these were all shot under the same lighting conditions, under the same weather conditions. There is no sky in all of these images. That commonality in this is what essentially satisfies this issue of topology. Does this make sense? However, if you look at it again through the Google site, you'll see that there's all sorts of this right here. As a matter of fact, the very next one over. This is actually done by a group, and I'll show you a group of artists that you can actually look at. Um, this is a group of Germans. They, they were working in the 1970s when they actually started this whole thing. And it was these just in these industrial buildings. So it's not just how you approach shooting it. It's the subject matter in all of this was also identical. So it was all these sort of industrial um, um, uh, water towers was what they were doing. They, uh, they went and did, they did hundreds of these type of projects. But you get what's sort of like going on in here. As you continue to look through these images, though, you'll see that it's not necessarily all about buildings or architecture. Again, what is the commonality in this? It's not just the letter four or the number four. It is also, every single one of these is scaled exactly the same size. The fours are not bigger and smaller and all over the place, although there's some variation in size, but not as bad as it should be. But again, it is this whole notion of repetitiveness and that you are seeing and looking at this in a way that, 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 that forces a commonality amongst all of the elements. Does that make sense? Yes, Adam. When it comes time to like presenting the laws, yes. Oh, absolutely. No, no, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. How many people in this room have had have been told that if you really are a gifted photographer, you should be cropping in camera and you should never have to crop after? That is a fucking lie. <laughs> that is a lie, 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 lie. If you are not cropping your imagery, you're an idiot. I'm just saying that right now. Whoever told you that needs to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> so again, the guys again, look at this, look at this. Everything about this. So you need to, but this is what you need to think of. It also has to do with perspective. You cannot can you could not have shot this camera. You know, I shot five of them looking down on it, and then I came down low and shot three more coming into it, whatever. That defeats the whole purpose of what we're trying to do here. What we're trying to do is for you to force yourself to pick a single approach to a group of elements and force yourself to be able to repeat that. So it's everything. It's color, it's perspective, it's scale, it's tone, it's um, uh, angle, it's all of those things are a commonality of this. Does this make sense? So again, it's not limited to objects. You can actually do people. It works the very same way. So you can see it's happening right in here. And again, where this is being cropped. It's always right at the bridge of the nose, always underneath the chin. All of these have that same same exact same thing that's actually happening in here. If you go back to our Moodle site, do not go out of Google Images yet if you can uh, avoid it. Now, I'm just going to click the back button so I can do an image search. Go back to our Moodle site. If you look at the assignment for topology, you will see down here at the bottom that there's a series of artists here that are extremely famous for doing this kind of work. So, for instance, if you double-click on the Beechers and copy it, I just double-clicked it to select the name, up to the Edit menu, and come down to Copy, and then go back to your Google Images and paste that in, it will actually take you to their work. And you can see exactly what it is they were doing and their approach to this. These are the people that I was just showing you that had done the water towers. These are probably the most famous people for doing this particular kind of typology. Does this make sense, what we're going with here? So again, if you're struggling with understanding what is really being looked for in here, copy and paste those artists. Go to Google Images. It's the perfect place to look at their work. 
I keep trying to load Columbia's um, uh, library. I've got a whole lecture on this with slides and everything on Columbia's um, uh, library server, but the library server is not happy with me right now. So I don't think it's happy with anybody. So I'm not sure, but nonetheless. Are there questions about this? Okie dokie. I'm going to look at one other thing really quick and see one other artist that's in here. No. Anyway, um, I would take a look at these if I were you guys. I would just blow through these really quick, just like we just did. So again, I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to try Dan Graham. Let's try him. Sure, why not? Huh. Doesn't look like a apology to me. So, so much for Dan. Let's try William Christenberry because I love that name. Yeah, again, I don't, well, pot here. Yeah, the barns. Uh, and again, once you get into some of these, you can also actually click on this to actually view more, and it'll do stuff that's more similar. And so again, yes, would this satisfy that sort of notion of typology as it would? Make sense? Are there questions about this? Okay, that takes care of that. Um, let's go back into Photoshop really quickly. I want to show you guys how you actually do advanced black and white printing. Um, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I think in the entire, uh, probably throughout all the foundation courses, and most of the advanced courses as well, you guys will actually be told that you always want Photoshop to manage the, the color in the printing that you actually do, right? So if we were going to print this normally, and I want everybody to do these steps with me. So go into Photoshop. Hopefully you've got the tree image open. Go ahead and make it as a black and white. This is the steps that you would go through to actually generate this image. So I want to show you a couple things because there's a, a number of you actually managed to do the sharpening layers in this. A number of you guys didn't. I deducted for that. So the things that I really looked for in the work that you guys turned into me last week was, number one, I was looking for smart objects. Most of you guys actually did this. Um, then I was looking for adjustment layers that would actually control local things. And they didn't necessarily control everything. Um, but I wasn't really a hard ass about that. So, however, the one thing that was missing in a lot of it was the sharpening layers. So again, when you take an image like this that appears to you to be text sharp on screen, when you go to print it out, imagine what it's like when you blow your nose on a piece of Kleenex. That liquid spreads out in the paper when it hits the paper. It's not, it, it's, and they call this a dot gain. That's what the printer term for it is. So, unfortunately, what happens is when you print out something that's nice and sharp like this, the detail, all the ink, when it hits the paper, it starts to bleed out. So to compensate for that, you sharpen the print. You actually over sharpen the print for what you think it's supposed to look like on screen. But then when you actually use that to do the printing work, whatever, it compensates for the bleeding. So you tighten things up by sharpening it. And then when it bleeds out in the print, you end up having pretty much what you see on screen without the sharpening turned on. Does that make sense? All right, so we're going to go through sharpening one more time. So does everybody have at least the base layer here and the black and white layer on, layer on top? Do you agree you've got that? Some of you actually tried to sharpen this layer right here. That would be a mistake. And some of you also sharpened the base layer first, and then you did continue to do work on top of it. That defeats the purpose of sharpening. What you want to do with sharpening is this. You want to get the image to look perfect on screen. And then you want to add a sharpening layer on the very top so that you can turn it off because you don't want to use it when you're showing pictures on screen. So you need the ability to turn it off as well as to have it on. But sharpening is the final thing that you do. Sharpening for output is always the last step. It's always the top layer so that when the time comes that you want to do something for your website, you simply turn off the sharpening layer for your printing. You process your file for resize it, crop it, whatever for your website, and you're good to go. 
But when you want to print the thing out, then you actually turn that layer back on, you print it out, and your prints look great. Make sense? So in order to do this, we need to actually have a combination of all our layers. What we need to do is we don't want to just sharpen one layer. We don't want to just sharpen the other layer. We want to sharpen every. We want to sharpen a version of this file that's all put together. That's all the layers put together. So if you've got ten layers or fifteen layers or however many layers, you want to put them all together, and that's what you want to sharpen. Make sense? So in order to do that. Select your very top layer. In that case for us, it would be the black and white layer up here on top. In order to actually then do this into a single layer, this is a keyboard command. It's the only way I know to do this. So um, you need to write this down, or you need to watch the video again. Uh, it's probably easier to write this down. That's what I would suggest you do. So this is the keyboard command shortcut. You hold down the command key. That is the key just to the left of the space bar. You hold down the Option key, that is the key right next to it. You hold down the Shift key, which is the uh, row, just one row up, all the way to the left, and you hit the letter E. So again, it is Command, Option, Shift, E. And what you should get is a merged copy of that layer sitting up on top. Oh. Okay. No, no. That's a, great, that's a great call. That's a great call. Okay. So, if you can't remember that, there is a workaround. I, I'm sure there is a keyboard command for that. And I think it's that you replace, um, command is replaced by control. And I'm sure it's the exact same thing. You don't have option either, do you? What are the two keys? No, it's all. That's yours. It's control, alt, shift, E would be yours. Okay? Yeah, that would be yours. So, if you can't remember this, if you've done this, hit Command Z right now to undo it. If for some reason you cannot remember this, there is an old school trick to this. So, I need to know right now, do we go through the old school trick that's going to confuse everybody or we just stick with what we've got? Let's stick with what we've got. So, Command, Option, Shift, E, or Control, Alt, Shift, E. And you now see our black and white layer. It's sitting on top. This is now a fully baked black and white layer. This has been rasterized. It's not a smart object anymore. The black and white um, layer itself is baked into this file. Yeah, and you can see it's sitting, it is black and white. It's sitting up on top of that. So all the layers get merged into one. Anything that was turned on and visible gets merged into one. Make sense? Okay, so for instance, I'm going to show you this. Don't do this, but I'm going to show you on mine. I'm going to command Z undo mine really quick. I'm going to put another layer up on top of mine, just a blank layer, <clears throat> and I'm going to take a paintbrush and paint a big dot in it. Okay. And I'm going to now hit Command, Shift, Option, E, and you'll see that that big layer, that, that thing has been burned into my layer right here. Again, any visible layers that you've got on will be put into this guy. So I'm going to get rid of those. And again, select the top layer. That's the whole key to this. You want to select the top layer because I want you, everybody to look at this as well. This can also happen to you. If you've selected the bottom layer, in our case right here, and do Command Option Shift E, it puts the layer in the middle, which is in the wrong place. It always puts it above the layer that you've selected. So you always select the top layer when you do this, and you'll be good to go. So Command Shift Option E. I just did the exact same thing. Select the top layer. Command Shift Option E. It's up on top. So now here's the trick about how you turn this into a sharpening layer. You come up to the filter menu, and you come down to other. Look up at my screen to see where I'm at right now. Up to the filter menu. Again, I'm doing this on the layer that we just made. You can tell I'm doing it on this layer because this guy is highlighted. You can see it's highlighted. So again, up to the filter menu, down to other, down to high pass. So look up at my screen to see where I'm at. You will do this for everything you print in this class. Every single file that I look at, if I don't see the sharpening layer, you're going to lose points for it. So I'm giving you the easy thing here. I'm showing you it doesn't, this never changes. Always the last layer, the last step. Up to the filter menu, down to high pass, and a screen will come up. And the value you put into this screen is somewhere between 0.9 and 1.1. If you have a 0.9 in here, it's, so it's a very small range. It's only a range of a couple of tenths. If you have a, a 0.9 in here, if you cannot see anything in this screen at all, if you don't see any part of your image at all, you need to bump this up a little bit. If you go up to a 0.1, if it looks like this, 
you've gone too high. I'm just kidding. Um, so anyway, somewhere between that 0.9, if you want to be simply lazy about it and hit one pixel in there every single time, you will probably be pretty close. And then you say, OK. This thing now turns gray. The last step in this is to change the blending mode of this layer. Blending modes are this guy right here. Now, what blending modes are, just so that you guys know, we get into blending modes somewhat in this class, not a lot. But basically, all blending modes do is they look at this layer here. They look at the actual RGB values of this layer, and they mathematically interact with the layers that are underneath. So, for instance, let's say that you had um, you had a layer here on the bottom, and it had a pixel that had a value, we'll just say grayscale, it had a value of, of, of 116. And then you've got another layer up on top, and this layer up here has got a value of, of uh, 2. If you change the blending mode of this to add, the result of this that you end up getting is a layer, a pixel that looks like it's 118. So it's just a mathematical interaction. You don't need to know any more than that just to understand that that's what blending modes are. So it's going to force this layer to interact with the ones that are down here. You need to change this blending mode from normal down to overlay. This is now your sharpening layer. If you zoom into your image, you will see what it did. So I'm zoomed into mine pretty tight right now, and you can turn it on and off, and you will see that primarily it puts in contrast around your edges. So can you guys see that this is actually getting contrasted around those edges? That is what the sharpening issue is. So you really want your image to look like this without that layer turned on. But because the printing process will soften this image, you need to sharpen it like this so that when it gets softened, it looks like the image looked like with the thing turned off. Are there questions about this? It's going to be for every single image you print. So then when now, when you go to actually build an image that would be for your website, you would leave that layer turned off. And when you're going to actually print it out, you would simply turn that layer on. You should get into the habit also of renaming this layer by simply clicking on, double clicking on this thing that says layer one and call it sharpening. And say, okay, are we good on this? Are there questions about this? Okay, next thing up, printing. So typically now, if we were gonna print this thing out, again, we would turn on our sharpening layer because we want this to be printed sharp. You would come over to the file menu, you would come down to print. Now, your all's computers, I don't know what drivers they have included on these computers, so we'll see right now. Just click on that drop down menu and see what you get. No, you don't get anything. I do. Why? What photo would you put it on? Yep. And the two that you turn in next week should have it, and the, whatever you turn in the week after should all have it. This should just be standard. Nothing gets not printed, and nothing, nothing that you print is not sharpened. Yes. Again. Yes. That's what's due. Okay, so um, you guys may not have the same options that I've got here, only because the drivers for the printer have not been included on these guys. So we will try. I don't know what you can select here. It might actually be close. I don't know what any of these things are. All right. Uh, hmm. Let me see how crowded things are out here.
a lot of weeds. All right, so I'll make this a little more beautiful. You've seen Diane wear this week. Diane, oh God. This a lot of All right. Okay. <laughs> You're going to have to watch this. I'm going to do this on my screen, okay, because the, you don't have the drivers loaded on these to actually th – these are not connected to any Epson printers, and they're not ever going to be connected to Epson printers, so they haven't put any on here. If you're working on a laptop and you've actually got a driver, either for a Canon or an Epson loaded, otherwise I need you to watch this happen here, and then we will go out into the lab, and you guys can actually do this out in the lab, okay? We can actually go through the steps of doing it out there because I really want – you doing this hands-on, again, you know that's, I believe in that, right? Okay, so I just want you to watch. I'm going to go through this pretty quick first. You will have this on the video so that you'll, or you're able to go back and do this, okay? But as far as black and white printing goes, I would suggest, you don't have to do this, but I would suggest, if you really want to see the difference in this, that you actually do a regular black and white print the way you normally would. And then I want you to try this advanced black and white printing method and just look at the two prints and decide in your life what you want to do. How many people in here, I know that there are people in here that are concerned about doing black and white, they actually do. How many people in here are interested in doing black and, serious black and white work? Then you need to really pay attention to this. Okay, so typically what would happen is this. You would open up, you would click on the print, let me cancel out of this really quick. You would come over to the file menu down to print. A dialog box will open up. It looks like this. You would pick your printer first. I'm going to actually do this as if we were printing to an Epson Stylus Pro 4900. Um, yeah, because I don't have the P series on mine yet either. So you would pick your printer here first. You would also here in color handling, you would change this to Photoshop manages color. That's what you would do. Then, fi not finally, go back up to printer settings. And in the printer settings, you would pick, again, your page size. So if you're doing this to U.S. letter, which is 8.5 by 11, you would pick this. If you're doing SB, which is 13 by 19, you would pick your, you pick the size of print that you're actually going to make. Uh, wait, I take it back. Hang on one second. Let me cancel out of all this. One last step that we did right here. We have not resized this image to actually do our print. We sharpened it. That was great. But you need to make sure that this image size, up here to image size, is printable on an eight and a half by 11. So in my case it is, if this ended up being some you know huge, if this was like a, a 11 by 14 or whatever, you would actually wanna change the size here. You guys did all of this, so I'm guessing that this is not a challenge for you guys. Is everybody's comfortable with resizing their prints, right? All right, so I'm just, you, uh, you do not wanna resample this part. There's no real reason to resample this part. Okay, so anyway, I'm gonna hit cancel out of that. So again, back to print. Dialog box opens, you pick the printer that you're going to actually use, you click on the printer settings, you would pick the size that you're going to use right here, then you need to also click on this drop down menu right here and come down to the printer settings, this thing right here, this is critical, you come under printer settings, you need to pick the type of paper that you're using, and it'll get, you'll get it in this drop down list. Now, in this case, this is all, it's an Epson printer, so the only things that you get available to you here are Epson papers. However, you pick something that if you're using, for instance, if you wanted to use a Hannah Mule Luster, you would pick the premium luster for this I instead. If you were working on a, on a, um, a Hannah Mule matte paper, you would come in here and probably pick ultra premium presentation matte. You need to pick the media setting. That's what they call this. You've got to pick the media setting. If you're using Epson papers, you pick the exact one. If you're using somebody's other brand of paper, you need to pick the one that's actually the closest to this. We will make custom profiles in this class because the truth of it is, you can't really do this and have this work. If you're using a Hannah Mule glossy paper, and you pick an Epson Glossy, it's not really gonna work for you. But I will show you how to make one, a custom profile that you can then use that will be perfect for you. Does that make sense? So my suggestion in the studio, the digital department has always suggested that you guys, they're suggesting you print on Epson uh, Ultra Premium Presentation Matte, is that what they're suggesting? Or Luster. Okay, so then you would simply pick the photo premium load of uh, Luster paper right here. So this part has been set, Again, you don't need to worry about this output resolution or this. You can leave these at their default. You would hit save to this. Then you need to go to, again, this drop-down menu that Photoshop manages color. 
And then you need to find that same printer profile again in this drop down menu. The printer profile here, and we said it was the Epsom Premium Presentation Luster. It's this guy right here. You need to pick it a second time here. Then you would leave normal printing. Relative color metric is probably good for the most of you. You could possibly use perceptual. It would only be one of those two. Um, we will talk later at some point about what the difference in them is. You would definitely leave black point compensation on. Does anybody want to know what these terms are? No, you just want to know to leave this shit on. Okay. And then you would hit print and you should be good to go. And if you do this, what you are really doing is this is now a black and white image that you're actually printing in color. This is, these are all color, uh, you're using the full color gamut scale on this. That's what's actually happening here. Does that make sense? So it's not like you're going to a grayscale printer. Those things actually do exist, but they don't have anything here. There's no real reason to do them here because the advanced uh, printing method that I'm going to show you right now will actually take its place. Make sense? Okay, so that's when, that's how you would certainly do all of your color printing is done like this. Okay, but for your black and white stuff, things change a little bit. So for your black and white stuff, I'm going to show you what does change. For black and white, you still want to pick the printer that you're going to use. In this case, it would be the Epson 4900. You would still make this sharpening layer first. You would still size your image first so that it was the correct size to be printed on this piece of paper. But then in printer settings, things change. And in printer settings, you would click on the printer settings dialog box again. Again, you would open up and you would pick the size of your paper first that you're actually going to print on. However, there's two things you need to set now in, your, in this drop-down menu. The first one is color matching. You need to change this here. And when you click on this, this dialog box will open and you see you can't select anything. And the reason you can't select anything here is because you still have Photoshop managing color here. So you need to cancel out of this dialog box and you need to change the color handling from color, from Photoshop manages the color to the printer manages color. Now, I should tell you, this is only available on Epson printers. This is not available on Canon. This is only available on Epson. So at any rate, printer manages the color. Now when you come to your printer settings and you click again, your layout, your page size you've already picked, but now when you click on color matching, you have the option to click on Epson color controls and you want to click on that. You are now letting the printer do your black and white conversions for you. Uh, and the reason this matters is that those Epson printers have four color, uh, four sets of gray ink inside them. They've got a photo glossy ink, a matte ink, they've got a light I mean a light K, which is light black ink, and a light light as well. And what you're doing when you do this is you're actually enabling that to use all of those inks to generate a black and white print for you. Make sense? Uh, so at any rate, you would do that. We're not done yet though. You would come down to printer settings and in printer settings you would change this print mode from this AccuPhoto HDR to advanced black and white. When you do that, you will get this thing. It looks like you will get again one other thing in here that says color toning. You can actually tone your black and white prints. So is anybody ever in here, did anybody in here ever do much darkroom work? Okay, if you did darkroom work and you were a black and white printer, um, there used to be, the people that were most famous for this were Agfa. They had a series of papers that were warm toned and cold toned. Ilford does the same thing. They'll be slightly warmer or slightly cooler. They have a little bit of red in them. A little, they're not a perfectly neutral gray. They'll be pushed one way or the other. You have that option to control that here and when you do this advanced uh, printing. So neutral will actually be, um, the colors will appear to st strictly be gray to you. If you go to the cool, your grays will actually have a small amount of blue in them. If you go to warm, they have a slight amount of uh, red in them. And if you go to sepia, they have a slight amount of brown in them. Um, however, this seems like a pretty blunt instrument to me right here. So I don't really do this part here. Instead, what you could and should do is if you click now on this advanced color settings, you get this dialog box that allows you to control everything. This allows you to not only control the toning that we just saw, so it's this part right here, the neutral, cool, warm, sepia, and all that. However, you can actually come down here and control 
the exact amount of toning that you want to put into your print. So this should look familiar to you guys. This is the color wheel. This is a very muted version of the color wheel because, again, we are dealing. What is missing in this color wheel? No, what's missing? I've got, I've got hue. That's what's going around here. I've got saturation because that's what's going here into the middle. This is a perfectly neutral color here. What's missing in here is lightness. There are no whites or blacks in here. This is, so this is strictly toning. You can actually click on this and change. You can custom build the tone that you want in your print. And if you want to repeat that, you simply pay attention to what these numbers are. So you'll see as I'm moving this around, these numbers change. This is strictly the orientation of that toning. So you may find, oh my God, the toning at a R1 horizon move and a vertical of 27 is just the most amazing black and white toning you could imagine. Does this make sense? Personally, I don't use this a lot, so just throwing that out to you so that you know what it is. To zero it back out, you simply hit zero into these. In the tone here, by definition, normal is actually darker. This is, you do, nobody uses normal. Every, darker is basically the normal setting for this print dialog box. If you want to ultimately make your print darker, you have two options. You could change it here in the print dialog box, or you could actually go back to your image, put a curve on this thing, and make the thing darker. Make sense? So, and then you can also control other issues here. These, in my opinion, are much better controlled here in Photoshop than they are here in the print out dialog box. Um, but that's my opinion. Does that make sense what's going on here? So at any rate, this is primarily about toning. You will also notice a preview window right here. As you start to drag this stuff around, you will get a preview of what it's supposed to look like. So that's actually a red toning of a black and white image. Make sense? Okay, and that would be a cyan one. So. Again, you can sort of see where this is all going. And then, again, you would hit Save for this. And then, again, because the printer is managing your color, you don't have to select a print profile. And then you would simply hit Print. Are there questions about this? It's a little confusing. There is on our website. So I need everybody to jump on our website really quick. Back to the Moodle site. If you go to this right here, this is for week five, the week that we're in right now, this part right here. If you click on this advanced black and white printing Epson 4900, it will walk you through all of the steps about how you do this. The, they have told me, I've never done this on these P800s, but that the print dialog box is virtually identical. All right, are we good about this? Is there any reason at all we need to go out in that lab and do this right now? None at all. You guys can follow this recipe, right? So again, last suggestion to you is to try both ways. Do it on a little baby print. You don't need to do something big. Just kick out a baby print. Do the one that the, the normal color way that you print everything with the proper profile for that piece of paper. And then try this Epson printer, this advanced guy. It's got to be a black and white print. Uh, but just try it. And then look at the two of them next to each other and say, which of these do I like? Make sense? Are there questions about this? I have a question. Okay, if I want to print on my machine, yes. and I can't do this, right. okay, I can just Yes, it is okay. It's fine. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. But you know what we should also do, and remind me this next year, it's some time. I want, to sh I want to show you guys how to generate a custom profile. Um, because the advantage of being able to generate a custom profile is that it opens you up to being able to use any piece of paper in any printer but do it in a controlled way. Do it in a way that you get predictable color. So you're building your own one of these printer profiles to use. And it's all based on running that, whatever media you're using. So for instance, if you could jam a piece of leather through one of those printers, you could actually profile it and create a profile to actually print on it and you would have reproduce, you would have color, color workflow managed, color workflow managed workflow on that and you would have reproducible color on that hunk of leather. For people who, it's really important a lot for people who do canvas, people who do fabric, if you run fabric through a printer, and a lot of these printers will actually handle fabric, um, you would want to actually do your own profiling because there's no way to anticipate how fabric is actually going to react with ink. Um, so it gives you a way to actually measure how it will handle it and uh, then get predictable color. Okay, so we've gone through the assignments. We've gone through all of that. Okay, I'm going to make Lexi's head hurt right now. There's a couple of last things that I want to touch on really quickly for you guys because there was still some confusion about this. 
there was some confusion about file formats and other things. So I want to make sure everybody's on the right page. So if you can jump back into Photoshop again for me really quickly, hopefully you still got the tree open. Uh, I'm going to hit cancel out of this dialog box. If you don't have the tree open, just get some image open. It doesn't really matter. Um, but at any rate, I need some, you need to have some image to work with. If you can want to save this thing in a different format. So right now, this thing, my file has not been saved. Uh, right now, it doesn't exist as anything. Uh, it has not been saved. To save this as a file, you would come up to the file menu and you would come down to save as. You do not want to hit save, you want to hit save as. And a dialog box will open it up and it will allow you to name your file and put it anywhere you want to put it. So in our case, I'm going to again, because I, I, I have a toss folder on my computer so that every time I demonstrate something that I really don't want to hang on to, I simply call it toss and I throw it in the toss folder. And then once a month, I go in that toss folder and I throw everything away. Um, it'll keep your desktop neat and tidy. Well, not really, but anyway, it'll help. Uh, so at any rate, I'm going to name this toss again, which is what I call it, just about everything. You will see right now that there is a .psd after this. That stands for Photoshop file. And this .psd, I didn't type in. It is supplied by this drop-down menu right here. If you click on this drop-down menu, these are all the possible options that you of file types that you can save a Photoshop file in. I had somebody actually turn in a PNG file. That is a baked file that has no layers. It has nothing. All this stuff in here is actually gone. If Well, let's see. If you were, for instance, you see we've got layers right now. If you come up and you want to try to save this thing as a JPEG, so go ahead and pick JPEG, you will notice that you get this warning, and it says right here, it has turned this thing off. You get a warning right next to this that you don't get to save the layers. JPEGs cannot save layers. A JPEG is a flat file. It cannot handle layers. The only thing that can handle layers is the Photoshop file. That's one. The second possibility is this large document for format. What large document format is is that the Photoshop file has a two gigabyte limit. If you want to go above that, you save it in this large document format. This is also a Photoshop file. You'll see that the extension here is PSB. That still stands for Photoshop Big. It has the same properties as a Photoshop file. It'll keep all your layers. It'll function the same way. It's just the way you have to use it if you're going to go above two gigabytes. The next one down, you don't care about any of this stuff. These were all image file formats that were used to do um, early internet work, like GIFs is early internet work. Uh, an EPS is a, um, a, Brian actually might have a reason to use this. Is anybody in this room doing graphic arts other than Brian? Anybody in this room work in uh, Illustrator or if you're working in Illustrator and um, um, Illustrator would be one example, in design not really so much, but in Illustrator you could actually choose to save this. What EPS stands for is encapsulated postscript. Uh, this will actually turn this into something that's a little bit friendlier to uh, being able to bring an image into that, but nonetheless. Uh, you all know what JPEG is. It is a format that actually crushes your image. It will flatten it. It will also uh, bring it, um, uh, anyway, not the thing that I would want you guys to use in. You'll see there's other formats in here that are really bizarre, one of a kind, one-offs. Uh, PGN is actually uh, supposed to be the uh, new JPEG. It's supposed to be a more advanced version of JPEG, but nonetheless, it has all the same limitations to it. Uh, finally, down here, you've got this TIFF file. That would be one of the other options. So for this class, your options are Photoshop, Large Document, or TIFF. Uh, these other for, uh, Photoshop formats down here, are if, you are, if you can find a computer that's actually running a version of Photoshop 1, good luck. Uh, but that's what these guys are about down here. So that's what you would actually save these guys in. So in my case, I'm going to leave it as a Photoshop file. You could say that you don't want to keep the layers anymore. There would be no reason to do that. And you could also uncheck this embed your color profile. Both mistakes, both things you would neither one do here. And then finally hit save. Are there any questions about file formats? So if, if it's over two gigabytes, you can go large. Exactly. You'll have to. You'll get rejected. If you try to save it as a Photoshop file, a warning dialog box will come up and say you can't do this. It's too big. In which case, go to the large document format. And there, it's unlimited. Um, and if you get rid of the layers, does that um, affect the printing? It, it won't print. affect. What will end up happening is that all of this will get flattened. So it'll do this. It will simply flatten all of this. And this is what you'll end up with. And you won't have sharpening, color, smart objects gone, raw data is gone, no, all that's gone. 
when I, again, I always I create what I call master files, um, and they're the biggest that I can possibly have them. Is, is That's that, how is I start out. It's, I'm sorry. Is that uh, Photoshop? Yeah, exactly. It's a fully layered Photoshop file. Okay. Uh, are there questions about that? All right. So those are file formats. Uh, we've already talked about uh, file size in here, so you can see file size in here really quick. I need everybody to do this. If you'll change, still have your uh, tree file opened up. If you will actually click on, the, if you look up at my screen where I'm actually looking at right now, it's a drop down menu. It should, depending on how yours is set up, mine is set up to show me my profile, which I think is really important. It's a good check for me to know. This is the working space. This is the color working profile that we're in. If you click on this flyout menu, though, you can actually change this. And you can change this to show you the size of your document. And you will see that the size of my document, there's two numbers in here right now. You've got 18 megabytes, and then you've got a slash and a 36 megabyte. And the reason that I've got this is that this file now has doubled in size because of this image layer right here. This image layer has basically doubled it. It's, 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 I've got one image layer right here, which is 18 megabytes in size. But now that I've got a second image layer right here, it's now gone grown to 36 megabytes in size. You'll see if you click on this sharpening and drag it down to add another version of that, that this thing is now jumped to 54. Every time you add a complete image layer, your file size doubles. I'm not, it doesn't double, it, it doubles what the original file size was. So what this is showing me is how big my file would be, but also how the size it would be if I flattened it. Does that make sense? So if everybody looking at this right now, I want you to go up to the image menu, down to mode, and I want you to come down and change this to 16 bits per channel. This is now going to be a 16-bit image, I hope. And you will see, by looking at the numbers down here, that you've just doubled your image. What was 18 megabytes of the original flattened file is now 36. What was 54 megabytes for the image now in 16 bit? It's double. And I'm going to show you why right now. So, Okay, everybody gets flipped out when they hear bit depth. Everybody's like, oh shit, this is gonna be math again. This isn't gonna be that much math. This is the simple math. Okay, so we're gonna start out with a binary system. All computers are binary systems. And although you may not know what that is right now, you're gonna know what it is in just a minute. So a light switch has two possibilities in the world. The light can either be on or it can be off. That's all it can be, on or off. That is a binary system. There's two possibilities. Bi is two. Those are the, that's it. It's as simple as that, right? So with a single light switch, I have two possibilities. The light is either turned on or it's turned off. That's all I've got. If I add a second switch to this, though, I end up with four possibilities in combination. Either both of the switches can be off, both of them can be on, or the one on the right is on, or the reverse. Does that make sense? So I added a switch, and my possibilities double. If I add a switch again, they double again. Every single time I add a switch, my possibilities double. Does that make sense? So I'm up to three switches now. I've got eight possibilities. If I add another switch, how many possibilities do I have? 16. 16. Add another one. How many? You guys have got it. Bit depth in a nutshell. Okay, a transistor. Computers are made up of transistors. That's what is on that little chip that's inside the processor in there. It's got billions of them now. It's shocking that they can get this many on there. A transistor is a switch. That's all it does. And what a transistor does is it works just like this switch right here. When it's on, it lets electricity through. And when it's off, it blocks electricity. So a transistor is a switch. However, 
some very clever people who invented computer systems back in the day said, you know, we can actually assign a number to that. If the switch is off, they give it a zero. If the switch is on, they give it a one. So this switch right here would be zero. That's a one. That's a zero. That's a one. It's not that complicated. Is anybody not following this so far? We're good, right? So one transistor gives you two possibilities, on and off. A second transistor doubles those. Again, either the, both of the switches are off, or both of the switches are on, or the one on the left is on, the right is off, the one on the right is off, and the, I mean, the left is off, the right is on. So, and again, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I know you guys will be able to answer this. I'm going to add another switch to this. How many possible, some possibilities am I going to have? Exactly. And if I added another switch and another, you guys have got it. Some very clever people at Apple decided, you know, we can actually assign tone to those numbers instead. We could assign a value to that. So we would say that if it was zero, that would be black. If the switch is off, if the switch is on, that would be white. And the very first graphic programs, that's exactly what they were. They were all, you worked only in black and white. There were no shades of gray at all. It was purely black and white. Um, there was an old program called McPaint that everybody was really excited about because you could actually sort of rudimentarily, I mean, it was like working with an Etch-a-Sketch. You could kind of do that, you know, but that was really it, right? So at any rate, as things got more advanced, they realized, oh, you know, if we add another switch to this, we can actually add two possible grays in between. So now we have black, we've got white, and we've got a couple of grays. If you add another switch, how many grays do you think we're going to have? Eight. Not four, six, eight. We start with two. We go to four. Then we go to eight. Then to 16. 32. What's the next? 64. Next. 128. Next. Does 256 ring a bell to anybody in this room? It is the range of tone that we have in Photoshop. 0 to 255 is an 8-bit grayscale image. So again, if we go 0 to 255, 0 actually is a tone up to 255. We have 256 tones because that is an 8-bit image. The easiest way to think about bit depth now is to simply say to yourself, Whatever bit depth it is, is the number of times you multiply two times. So if you do two times two, eight times, you'll get to 256. So count it out with me. Two times two is four. Times two is eight. Times two is 16. Two is 32. 64. 128. 256. That was eight times I did that. If I want to go to nine bit, 512. If I want to go to 10 bit, 1,024. If I want to go to 11 bit, 2,048. If I want to go to, you guys get where this is going, right? That's what bit depth is. It's just that simple. But this matters to us in a huge way because it's the number of available tones that we get to work with. So this is how they actually do it in grayscale. So again, two times two, eight times ends up being 256 tones. If you do that for a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel, you have 256 tones of each. So if you take your 256 reds and you multiply it times your 256 greens and you multiply that times your 256 blues, you end up with 16.7 million colors. <laughs> It's simple. You got to the 256, you have 256 possible greens. And you can combine that with 256 possible reds and 256 possible blues. Yeah, you'll see here. Maybe this will explain it to you. So hold on to this thought. Again, I'm not going to question you on the math part right here, but it's important that you understand what bit depth is and why you're using 8 bit or why you're using 16 bit. Those are decisions you have to make. I just mean like the 16 bit has more color than 8 bit. Massively more. Yeah, it's like it's more Massively more. So that's, a, and I'm fine with you guys just keeping that in, in your mind as long as you know that that's what's really going on. For a color image, it's a whole lot more colors. You still, the, the, what's, what's happening is you don't get more saturated colors, you don't get that. What you get is finer increments between each individual color. That's what you get. You get um, um, nuance. 
you get subtlety. That's what you get. And so you're going to see that right now. So um, this is the map. This is actually how it works. Uh, you, again, you don't have to memorize this, but if you start with a one-bit image in grayscale, you have two possible grays. In color, you actually have eight possible colors. Now, a lot of people, when you look at the version of this, I'm going to show you, you're going to say, well, that's not really eight, but it is. But nonetheless, again, what you have got in a one-bit image is you have two possible reds, you have two possible greens, and you have two possible blues. So two times two is four, times two is eight. So a one-bit, three-color image, you have eight possible colors. And then the math just goes on down. If you look again at our typical eight-bit image, you have 256 possible grays, and you've got 16 16,777,216 possible colors. Make sense? In 16-bit down here, you will see that you have got 65,536 possible grays. You've got over, okay, this is thousands, millions, billions, 281 trillion possible colors in 16-bit. The reason this matters is that the photo spaces that we are working on, I need everybody to go to their application folder. Down to the bottom of your application folder to the utility folder. In the utility folder, there is the color sync utility. We've been here before. Double click on this guy to open it up. <clears throat> so what? Application. Applications folder to the utilities folder inside the application folder. And then inside that utilities folder, you will have color sync utility. So here, look at my screen up here really quick. So it is... Okay, so it is applications to utilities to color sync utility. Double click on that to open it up. Again, do not select the first of the icons at the top which says profile first aid. Click on the next icon over that says profiles. You should have a system with a little drop down arrow next to it. And then if you look in this system, hopefully, I don't know if you guys can look down. We need to find another profile for you guys. And I'm going to say it's in, let me see really quick, because I think it's where yours hopefully will be. Sorry, guys, they scatter. Oh, here, I think. Nope. Yep, okay. It's going to be under other, down at the bottom, under library application support Adobe. And inside that, you should be able to find this thing that says Profoto RGB. Can you guys find that? If you can't, just look up at my screen right here because we're not going to spend long in here. I'm going to click on Profoto RGB. This is the Profoto RGB space. This is the other space that you will hear a lot of people suggest that you should be working in in Photoshop is this space right here. Can everybody see that? I'm going to hold this for comparison. If you're with me and you want to do the same thing I'm doing, come up to this little drop-down arrow, come down to hold for comparison, and then scroll all the way up to the top and pick Adobe RGB. And what you will see in here is Adobe RGB sitting inside of Profoto RGB. Profoto RGB is gigantic relative to Adobe RGB. And the problem that you run into is this, is that in an 8-bit color image, that's 16 million, 16.7 million colors, those colors are close enough in Adobe RGB to not cause you problems, to not cause you to end up with spaces. The colors are close enough to one another that they seem to give you continuous tone. However, when you go to Profoto RGB, that space is gigantic relative to that. So all of those colors are spread further apart to fill up that space, and it's not enough space. The minute you try to do any color correction in Profoto RGB, if it's in 8-bit, 
you start to pull the colors apart and you see the transitional edges. Instead of something appearing to be a continuous tone gradient, they end up with these, with these jumps, the stair stepping. You see the stair stepping in tone. So if you want to work in this gigantic space, you're welcome to do that in this class, but you have got to do it in 16-bit. And the reason you do it in 16-bit is because instead of 16.7 million colors, you have got 281 trillion colors to do it. That means that those colors are close enough to one another that when you start pushing things around with curves and whatnot, you don't end up pulling them so far apart that you can see the jump from one color to the next. Does that make sense? And now you know why, yes. So would you recommend for like, if you want to do an 8-bit that we bring it into Photoshop and then do it like after? Like, you lost me on that one. Okay, sorry, I don't know. I mean like, so that we don't end up like pulling apart colors, whatever, like, we should do it after we open it up. Actually, in my feeling is that there's no reason for anybody to be in 16-bit <laughs> ever. But I also don't believe you should be in Profoto either. Right. I, I, if you are going to do the Profoto route, you should do it from the beginning and do it all the way through. Okay, because I guess like in Lightroom, like it is in Profoto. No, actually, in Lightroom doesn't have a color space. That's one of the problems with Lightroom. Okay. Lightroom keeps it in your camera space, but never in Lightroom do you end up with a processed file. You only end up with the instructions to process it. You always keep the raw data there. It never becomes the final thing. In order to make a TIFF, You've got to process it out and then bring it back into Lightroom. It never exists in there. I guess it must be my camera shoots in ProPhoto then, or whatever. Because when I bring it into Photoshop, it says, do you want to convert into the yeah. space that's like the RDP? Oh, really? The yeah. So do I me a favor. Bring either your camera or some of your files next week so I can okay. look at that. I want to see that happen and see what's going on, OK? Because, okay. yeah, I'd rather color manage like, once I'm in Photoshop. And yes, you, you do. Photo. Yeah. So we yeah. should look at that. OK, that's right. What, what camera do you have? What are you shooting with? Uh, D7000. Okay, bring it in and let's take a look and make sure. Okay. All right. So does this make sense what's going on here? All right. So back to this, guys. We don't have too much of this more to go, guys. Just hang in there with me. So this is what it ends up looking at. This is a two, this is a one bit uh, grayscale image. There are two tones. You have black and white. This is what four bits, I mean two bits, four tones of gray will actually give you. Again, two bits, I've doubled the, the number of uh, possibilities. If you look at the bottom of my screen right now, I can't show you my mouse because when I do uh, this PowerPoint, I lose my mouse. But look at the bottom right here, you'll see the actual uh, 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 gray possibilities on the bottom. So if I go back one, you'll see at the bottom, I only have black, I only have black and white. If I go to the next one, I've got the four tones, so you'll see I've got white on this side right here, the two possible grays, and then black right there. If I go to the next one, and then the next bit, I get in four bit, I get 16 tones of gray, and you can see what they look like. And this is the stair stepping that I was talking to you about. If you are in uh, Profoto and you're using 8 bit, the minute you try to do any tonal correction at all, it pulls things so far apart that you see these distinct lines, these distinctions between the tones. This is not continuous tone. If this was continuous tone, this would look like just a, a, a grayscale ramp. This is going to be the very next picture that I showed you, I think. Yeah, this is 8-bit. And you see, 8-bit gives you the appearance that this is continuous tone. It's not. You have 256 tones of gray. It's just that, and the reason they picked 8-bit was a whole bunch of people sat there looking at a whole bunch of prints and said, how many tones do we need to emulate continuous tone? How many tones do we need it to look like a black and white silver gelatin print? And 256 tones, people figured at that stage of the game, those tones are so close to one another that they appear to be continuous to your eye. Does that make sense? So does that matter like about how big you're blowing it up too? Oh, not how big you're blowing it up, but how much tonal work you're really doing. I'm gonna show you. I'm going to show you the consequences of, uh, we're going to shatter an image totally tonight. Doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> okay, well, let me get through this part, the next part, though. This is eight, this is one big color. You have eight colors here. And I know you guys are looking at this and you're saying, that's bullshit. I've got four colors there. I've got black and a pure red and a pure green and a pure blue. The truth of the matter is, in for, in for Photoshop's purposes, the way Photoshop looks at this, it says you have got a black red and a pure red. You've got a black green and a pure green, and you've got a black blue and a pure blue. Now, we see this blacks as all being the same. Photoshop does not. They see these as being distinct. So 
I've got two reds times two greens times two blues is eight colors. Two times two is four times two is eight. If I go to two-bit color, this is what the image looks like, and that's the number of colors that I get. If I go to four-bit color, I have 4,000 colors. Again, not enough to simulate continuous tone. And finally, when I get to eight-bit, you get the appearance of continuous tone color, and your images look continuous tone because you've got these 60 million colors. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so I promised you we would shatter an image, so let's do that. Yeah, I'm sorry, what? So, There is no printer, even though they tell you it will print in 16-bit, there is no printer that will actually do it. There's no monitor that you can do. Every single monitor in the world is 8-bit. You can't see it. The people who want to work in Profoto, Profoto space is so large. Check this out. I mean, I'll see if I've got this here. I, in my opinion, there is not, but again, uh, there, there are a lot of people that would consider that blasphemy, but fuck them. I'm going to show you one other thing really quick that will help hopefully answer this. Uh, it's, it's not, it's just one image, guys, so don't, don't panic. Oh, shoot. Sorry, I've done this lecture down so much over the years. I've got to go back to the very first of them. Here. So if you look at the sort of the horseshoe thing here in the background, this guy is this, this thing that looks like sort of, they call it a horseshoe. It doesn't look like a horseshoe to me. But nonetheless, that is encompassing human vision. That's what you can see. So these other lines in here are giving you a relative idea of what these other spaces can do relative to your human vision. So for instance, the really curvy line. That's what uh, uh, Epson 4800 on a map paper can show you. So does that make sense, what we're looking at here? So for instance, your eyes can see all these amazing greens, all of this stuff, but your printer can't print any of that. All of that is, is out of gamut. And sRGB, you can see how small sRGB is right here. It's this first little triangle right here relative to Adobe RGB. You can see that Adobe RGB shows you much more green. Can you guys visualize this? Can you see what's going on here? Does this make sense? I know it's really much of that. Um, and then finally, this uh, is Profoto RGB. This is a big space out here. You can see how much larger it is than Adobe's RGB space, right? Does anybody see a problem with Profoto RGB? Yeah. Yes, indeed it does. Adobe RGB is, I mean, Profoto RGB is so large, it actually contains colors that you can't see. Do you have a problem with that? How do they even make that? It's a theoretical space. It's mathematically created. They can make them bigger. And the math called Photoshop, that, that's all Photoshop really does is math. It just, that's all it does. It changes the numbers. That's all it does. It can shove your colors right out here and you can never see them. I think that's a problem, but that's just me. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so let's shatter an image. Come on, this will be fun. This will be fun, hopefully. Okay, if you've got this tree thing, save it. You don't have to save it. Just don't close it up yet. I don't know if there's anything left I've got to do with it. We're going to create a new file. So come up to the file menu and come down and say new. And in this new file, just go ahead and leave it at the same 8 by 10, 300. Just make sure it says RGB color and in 8-bit. Has everybody got that? Okay, say okay to this. And it'll open up. You'll have a white screen. It'll look like mine. If you did it horizontally, it doesn't matter. It'll be the same thing. I want you to look over in your uh, uh, tool palette over here, and there should be right in the middle this thing that's called the gradient tool. So you may have the paint bucket selected, so it would be the paint bucket if you don't see this gradient. But if you click on that flyout menu, you will get the gradient tool. Does everybody have this guy? Okay. 
You also want to hit the D key to make sure that your foreground and background colors are at their default. Then if you come over to your image, you will see that your cursor, it changes to a little X the minute you get on the, you want to be as close to the side of your image as you can possibly be. And what I want you to do is click, hold down the shift key and drag across. And when you get, you'll see it drags a line across. And when you get to the other side, don't go beyond the other side, but right when you get to the other side, let go and you will have a gradient. Did that work for everybody? Okie dokie, good. I'm gonna do this a second time, up to the new menu, down to making another new file. And in this case, I want you to change this from 8-bit to 16-bit and say, okay. Now, you can tell the difference in your images because you'll look, if you look up at the very top of the title, you will see that the one we just made is this RGB slash 16. That 16 is your bit depth. If you look at your 8-bit guy over here, this RGB slash is your 8-bit color. Does that make sense what's going on? Okay. So we're going to do the same thing in this 16-bit image. We are going to actually create a gradient. So I'm going to click on this guy. I'm going to drag across. I'm going to hold down the shift key. Holding down the shift key just makes your line straight so that you don't pull some weird gradient up to the side. Uh, anyway, it just makes it straight. And you've got a gradient as well. So if you've got like my uh, uh, retouching space set up in yours, you should have an info palette up here. This info palette will actually tell you what these values are. And you can see right over here, as you start to come over to this area in black, eventually that RGB readout, this readout right here, will go to zeros, and that's black. If you go all the way into, if you go into the middle somewhere, you get to like your, in your mid-120s, and then all the way up here at the very end of this, whatever, you get to your 255. So we've just got a gradient that's pulled. Does that make sense what we've got going here? Are we good on this, right? Okay, so now comes the total shattering part of this. Uh, come up to the image menu and come down to adjustment and down to levels. So this kind of gets back to what I was talking about early. This is going to be destructive. This is not an adjustment layer. This is going to be something we actually do to this image. And what I'm going to do to this image is I'm going to crush it tonally. What I'm going to do is I want to say that I've got a full scale image right here. This histogram showing me full scale, zero to 255. And I'm going to crush it. I'm going to say for my output levels, I want to take this output level up to, uh, let's do, let's see, we'll do 120 in the middle. Let's do 123. So you put in 123 for this output uh, level, and then your other one should read 131, uh, no, 133. So what I'm doing is this, I'm taking, you can see, I'm crushing this thing tonally. I'm saying I want to take the blacks and the whites, and I want to, what was 256 tones, I'm now going to crush them down to the middle 10. I'm only going to have from 123 to 133, 10 tones in the middle. That's all I'm going to do. So I've just crushed this thing. Does that make sense what's going on? And then say, okay. And then we're going to go back to our 8-bit image, and we're going to do the exact same thing. So click on the 8-bit image to make it active, up to the image menu, down to adjustments, to levels, and just type in the same values. You can just click on this first one and put in 123, hit the tab key, it'll go over to the other one and put in 133. It's the same thing, and you can see it's put in these little sliders. It's brought your sliders right to the very middle. So again, I've crushed this tone, and if you say OK to this, they both look gray. And they both are gray. They're both middle grays, right? And if you hold your little cursor over the uh, edge of this on the far left-hand side and look at your readout, you'll say in your readout it says 123. And as you start to come across in the middle, it's into the 127s, 28. And all the way on the other side over there, it's up to 123. So what I did was I took an image that was 256 tones, and I absolutely brushed it. So... 0 to 255, and I crushed it down to 123 and 133. Make sense? Okay, I'm going to blow it back out again now. I'm going to run levels again, and let's start with the 8-bit image guy. So again, up to levels, image adjustment, levels, and a dialog box. And you can see, look at the histogram right now. That's exactly what we've done. We've actually crushed this guy. We, we, we took all that full range, smashed it down into the middle. 
I'm going to pull it back out apart right now. And to pull it back apart, you the, for the values that we're going to enter here in your input is going to be 123 and then, um, um, yeah, and then 133. So what this is now doing is I'm saying I want you to take 123 and make it black. I want you to take 133 and make it white. And I want you to pull all the tones out equally in the middle. So this is kind of like taking a slinky and mashing it closed and then pulling it back out and mashing it closed and pulling it back out. Does this make sense to what's going on here? So this is not in the output levels. This is in the input levels up here. 123 in the input level, 133. So what I did, I crushed this image down to 10 tones. Now I'm pulling it back out to the 256 tones, but there's only 10 tones in there. So you end up with, so go ahead and say okay to this. You end up with this stair stepping that happens because in order to make the 133 black, which it is, and the one, I mean 123, and then the 133 white, which it is, they have to separate all the other tones equally. So you end up with these spaces in between. Does that make sense what's going on here? If you actually go to the histogram, so go up to window, down to histogram, Again, histograms shows you what you've actually done. See these individual lines right here? Those individual lines are these tones that have been pulled apart. This image has been tonally shattered. That's what they call it. Are there questions about this? Okay, now let's do it on the 16-bit. We're gonna do the very same thing. On the 16-bit guy, we're gonna go up to image, down to adjustments, two levels. And we're going to type in the same thing here. We're going to type in 123, which was what our image was. And we're going to type in 133. So again, we're doing the same thing. And it looks to us like the exact same thing is going to happen, doesn't it? So you're like, Verser, why have you wasted my time? Say what? Here's... Well, that's because you hit OK. I don't know what Huh. Well, don't worry. Mine is showing the older version of this, nonetheless, because when I do hit OK, it will be perfectly smooth. Why? So here's the, here's the trick. This is what it really is. If you hit Command-Z to undo this, this gives you readouts. When you look at this RGB readout, this R, the guy right here, it's giving us information in 8 bits. So you look at this over here, and it's not really, this is a 16-bit image, but it's giving us 8-bit values. So the 8-bit value would be 123 up to 133, right? But if you click on this little drop-down arrow, see this thing right by the, uh, uh, by the uh, eyedropper right here? If you click on this, you can actually tell Photoshop that you want this readout to be 16-bit, not 8-bit, which is what this image really is. So when you do that, and now you come over and you look at this line, you will see that this starts at tone 15,000. I know you guys are dying to see what's going on here. So on the far side, what was 123 and 8-bit is actually 15,000. 806, and then what's on the other side? And so what do you get on there? Get close. Yeah, I'm like 17,091, are you guys close to that? Close enough, right? So we'll do 17,091. And we're going to subtract this 15,806. Can somebody do that on a calculator really quick? What was it? 17,091 minus 15,806. I'm sorry, it's what? 1285. There are 12,085 tones from this edge to this edge because we're in 16 bit. 12,000 tones, I, you don't think I can't get continuous tone out of 12,000 tones? So now when I pull these 12,000 tones apart, I've still they're still closer together than the original 8 bit 256 tones was. Does this make sense? 
So if you are going to do radical tonal work, you usually do it in 16-bit. There's a lot of people, anybody in this room scanning anything, using flatbed scanners, film scanners, any of that kind of stuff? If you are, when you get there, a lot of people suggest that you scan your stuff very flat in 16-bit so that you have the ultimate flexibility of tonal control once you get it into Photoshop. You do not commit yourself to this very narrow band, but you do it flat so that you get exactly kind of the thing that we just did. So it's much easier to control. Does this make sense? Okay, questions about bit depth. Okay. Finally, there is a daylight booth in this room in here. Does anybody use that guy? Why? White balance. Anybody else have any other idea why? See all your colors? Anybody else? Does it matter that you look at your stuff under daylight? Why? It's, it's, it, well, it would be bluer than tungsten lights at the very least, right? Yeah. Does that matter to your eyes? This is the biggest problem that exists in the world. So let me ask you guys this. Have you ever done, when you're sitting in a room with a lamp on, and you can see outside. Do you notice that the outside is either really blue and the inside is really warm? Does that happen to you? No, you don't notice that. <laughs> That's bullshit. That is absolute bullshit. You don't. What happens to your eyes, your eyes are adaptive. What happens, what your eyes do is this. In whatever the scene that you're in is, your eyes look at the lightest thing in that scene and they white balance it. They color neutralize it. So that's why if you're actually looking at prints, I mean, again, you can tell that these lights are warm because they're actually uh, down, uh, uh, they're, they're down very low, um, whatever. But the truth of the matter is, is that if you were to have a print that you were looking at under tungsten light and you were to look at it and then you were to walk outside with that same print out in daylight, your eyes look at the white border that would be around that print and they change the way you perceive that color. They make that color white no matter what color of light you're under. So there are other things that do change, though, that become a little bit more complex. So there is a value to using that boot, but do not think that that thing is religion by any means or any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> also, do not think that you cannot do really good quality color printing using tungsten lights to actually view your stuff, because you can. Uh, finally, D and G. So last thing we're going to talk about tonight, what is the D and G? Digital negative, it's basically, it's Adobe's digital negative. Are there, do you guys use it? Does anybody use it? Great, why? <coughs> That's a real good reason to use it, but keep on going there, yes. Uh, color passport checker. Color passport checker, definitely, <coughs> you have to have a DNG uh, in order to, to use that, but you don't have to, um, once the DNG has generated the profile for you, you can use that profile on a regular CR2 or regular NEF or any other tip or any, any other file you're using, right? So you don't have to use the DNG. You need the DNG to make the profile, but you don't need the DNG to use it. Make sense? Here's the thing, and I just, I'm going to throw this out to you guys. Uh, just, just so you know, the DNG was created by Adobe because one of the problems that's happened in cam with camera manufacturers, uh, there's a classic example. There was a cam camera manufacturer called Konica that existed. It was one of the first really big medium format people, and everybody loved it. Everybody shot with it. Konica went out of business, so they stopped supporting their software. Computer systems continued to evolve, and the software eventually would not <coughs> run on any computer. So all the I ever shot with those Konicas are now orphaned. You can't open them. That's problematic. So Adobe came along and said, okay, we'll do this. We're going to generate an open format. We'll call it the DNG. We will build software that will allow you to convert any of your raw files into the DNG. And we will promise you, because we all believe Adobe, we will promise you that for the rest of all eternity, we will support the DNG and you will always be able to open your files. And that sounds great, I think, right? So everybody started to embrace it, and that part was really wonderful. But there's a problem with the DNG and the converted part. 
Adobe said that if you have a raw file and you use our converter, we will convert everything. And they do. But the problem is, is that in everybody's raw file, and everybody has this, Canon has this in their raw file, Nikon has it in their raw file, Phase has it in their raw file, Hasselblad has it in their raw file. It's a thing called the secret header. That's exactly what they call it. And it's secret. And it will not let you, it, it's, it's the secret thing that lets, that, that lets like Capture One process a Capture One file better then camera raw can process that same file. And nobody can get at the secret header. The DNG can copy that information, but it doesn't know what to do with it. So I'm going to show you what that actually looks like and the consequence of this, and then you guys can decide whether you want to use the DNG or not. Oh, hang on, I've got a better place for this, I think. We're almost there, guys. We're almost at the end. This matters. Fucker. All right, hang on one second, guys. Only take a second here, I promise, and then we're out of here. Okie dokie. So, image and capture one. This is actually shot with a phase back. I'm going to simply color balance this guy. If you're not familiar with this program, don't worry about it. That's not really what's at issue here. This is just to show you uh, the difference about here. Different processors process your image differently. So, this is what it would look like. This has been neutralized. If you look at my exposure settings here, there have been no changes in exposure. There's been nothing done to this file except to white balance it. Now, let's look at this file in Camera Raw. And I will simply open this into Photoshop. Oh, wait. I'm going to do that again. I'm going to color balance it first. Sorry. So again, white balance, color balance this guy. Go ahead and open it. You guys see any difference? Which would you rather use? Guess what the difference in this is? The secret header. 
the thing that you guys didn't think mattered, that we're going to use the DNG. The DNG, the secret header is what makes this work. Photoshop, DNG can copy the secret header, but it can't interpret it. It doesn't, it copies it, but it doesn't understand what the fuck it means. And so this is what you get. These are both color balanced. I'll see you guys next week. So, yes, because this is a capture one file. It's a file from a page back. Sure. Bring a file up in there. Because I don't want to crop it's cropping in the initial part is a little confusing.